when the arrows fly and the waters rage, we know that we are safe because we can dwell in your presence. Under the shadow of your wings, we are safe. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, team. Appreciate that so much, and we appreciate the worship, and it's so good to see each and every one of you here today, and for those of you that are watching online, we just welcome you. We're so glad that you're with us today. Uh, Last week, we finished up in chapter one of Revelation, and one of the questions that came up uh, in that question, or in our message last week, was the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And though no serious student of the word would ever doubt that Jesus will come back to this earth, some people have doubted whether or not he would come for the rapture, what is called the rapture of the church. And it's important to say this, we do not know when the Lord is going to come. Uh, In fact, Jesus himself said, we don't know the day, no man knows the day nor the hour. But what we finished with last week is while we may not know the day nor the hour, we do understand and know the season and we know it's imminent. There's no fiddling with this anymore. It's become too obvious that the Lord's imminent return is on hand, and we need to be ready for it. Thus, the reading of this book, and thus the the study of what the book of Revelation has to say for us today. And I told you in this study that there is three obvious movements uh, that you're going to find in the book. The first was last week as the introduction. The second one is the one that we're going to be starting with today, and we'll end with next week, and then we'll go into the third movement, which is the absolute uh, study of end-time events, the middle movement. The one that we're going to be starting today is all about the churches, uh, the seven churches that this letter of Revelation was written to. And if you follow verse 19, he states the three movements very clearly, and this is what he says, because as you're looking at that in Revelation, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 19, he says this, write there what you have seen. And what is now and what will take place later. Now note that he's saying past, present, and future. And isn't that a whole lot like what Jesus said when he said, I am the past, I am the present, I am the future. Well, he didn't say it that way. He said, I am that I am. In other words, I live in any sphere of time that you live in. And Jesus said it so succinctly when he said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the first movement includes an introduction to who the writer is an introduction to why he is going to be writing this letter. And it shows a beautiful theological portrait of who God is. So who the writer is, who God is, and it shows a magnificent picture of the omniscient and the omnipotent uh, Christ who will bring God's plan for mankind to a close. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn to chapter 2, and we're going to be starting at verse uh, 1. And as we do this, we're going to preface the second uh, movement in this book by addressing the seven churches, specifically one, and he lists those in chapter 2 and in chapter 3. Now the question is going to come up, why is he doing that? Why is there only seven? Because we know this for a fact that there's half, uh, with over 60 years since the death and resurrection, of Jesus Christ, um, there has got to be hundreds of churches by this time, but he's picking out only seven. Were there only seven at that time? I can't believe that there was, because of of course, we know that there was a a church in Colossae. We know that there was one in Rome. We know that there was one in in, uh, um, Ephesus, of course. We know about the other ones like like Corinth, uh, because, and then of course, there's the one of Galatia, because Paul wrote his epistles to those specific churches. But these are the seven churches which are in Asia Minor. And as you know, Asia today, Asia is a whole continent. But in this particular time, Asia was simply a province and a much smaller one at that. So these seven churches, though, are a prototype of the seven conditions of the greater body of Christ. And we're going to be dealing with those. Now, if you segment these issues, if you segment the, the content or conditions and you apply them 
overall to all the churches, to the church of that day, but to the church through the ages of the last 2,000 years, and also to the uh, church of today, and really even the individual as it relates uh, with this information to your life, then you can have a greater application or appreciation for the reason to address these churches specifically. They were written generally or overall to seven churches, but they apply specifically to the greater body of Christ as a whole and to you as an individual. And all I have today is the time to be able to uh, talk about each church individually, one church specifically. Hopefully we can get to two or three of them, but, uh, but let's start off with Ephesus because the church, this church is one that we've talked about uh, in the past, and it's one that you and I fit into in our picture, but we need to look at Ephesus because it'll tell you how you and I fit into the theme of a completed church. Now, this one we're going to call the loveless church or the church that lost its first love. And let's look at it by starting off. Uh, watch how he compliments them because in verse 1, he says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right, to the angel of the church. Um, the word that's used there in the Greek, angel, is angelos, which is certainly a, a word that is used for uh, a, an angel, but it's also used for the word messenger or pastor to that church. And so he says, to the angel in the church of Ephesus, write this, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this. All right, now watch this now, watch this now, because when we have church. When you and I have church like we're having today, it's important for you to know that Jesus walks among us. And it says, the one who walks among the golden lampstands. He wants you to know that Jesus cares about church. He cares about you and I. And, and I think that at New Horizons, we've always known this, but we've, when we have church, you need to understand Jesus is in the building. He's in the middle of these seven lampstands, and he's in the middle or wants to be in the middle of everything that we're doing, both spiritually and, and, and physically in our lives, what we do, how we care about one another uh, as people. Uh, but he's in the building physically and spiritually, uh, but here nonetheless. Uh, and so he, when he's in the house, he says, I want to know what's going on with you. I want to know where you are. I want to know where your heart is. And so look in verse 2 because he says there, I know your deeds, I know your toil, I know your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not and you have found them to be false. And when you, uh, and you have perseverance, and, and for that, uh, you've endure, endured my namesake, and you've not grown weary, and for that, I commend you. Now watch how he does it. He says, you've got a lot of good things going on in your church, but, <laughs> and so in verse 4, he says, but I have this one thing against you, and, and now he's patting him on the back uh, before this, but now he's going to take the patent off and he's going to talk to him succinctly and straight and, and very clear-mindedly. He says in verse 4, but this I have against you. You have left your first love. In other words, you have the truth. You have the doctrine. You have all the things that any church would want to have going on, but you have lost your heart for me, and you don't love me like you used to. And, and what you don't want to know is that the key word here is love, but the key word beyond that is first. So you have that, not just love, but, but first love. In other words, your relationship with me is not your first priority. And I'm certain there's not a person that is in this building right now or watching us on TV or on your iPhone or on your, your iPad or however you're watching us. I'm sure there's not a person here that if the truth was to be known, hasn't ever put other things in front of Jesus first. For we all have. I think I'm going to go to the game today. I, I think, you know what, I just feel like staying home today. And, and for those of you who are watching on TV, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> because you are staying home, but that's all right too because of the emergency uh, that we have uh, in our uh, country and in really in the world today. But, uh, but as far as being real, I can honestly say that I have put things in front of the Lord be, uh, first myself. I've put ministry in front of Him, if you can even understand that, uh, that because I could become so involved with things that I've got to do for a service or, or things that I've got to say. 
I'll put aside my quiet time to be able to do the things that I think are for God when the most important things is just spending time with Him. And you say, how can that be? How can time become a thing? And we're all guilty of doing that, though. We're, we put things in front of the Lord, and, and we've all been guilty of doing that with our spouses. We've done it with our families, with our children. But why would the spouse, that is the body of Christ, do that to its bridegroom? And that's what we're challenging uh, right now, and that's what the Lord is challenging this church. You have forgotten your first love. Now, that brings up a different question. How could you have, or how do you know that you have a, let's say, a first love as opposed to a second love or a third or a fourth as opposed to that? Because here's how you know. Your first love always involves your greatest passion. What is your greatest passion? Let me ask you that. Where does your greatest passion lie? Does it lie in the Word? Does it lie spending time with Jesus? Maybe it lies at work. Maybe it lies in the, in the passion that you have going fishing or, or going in the mountain trails or just being outside. Maybe that's your greatest passion. But he's saying, how could you put your first love which is supposed to be me in front of any of those other things. And, and so does it lie in your hobbies? Does it lie in your sports interest uh, that could include anything from walking uh, in the mountains to uh, uh, watching football? But your first love will always be your greatest passion. And you will always spend the most time at that which you are dedicated to. Watch yourselves with that church because that is something we all fall into. And you will give any excuse you can to be able to put your favorite passion in front of God. And by the way, that's just our flesh. That's how our flesh reacts. And, and so watch this now because Jesus is saying that there should be no greater passion in your life than him. Even though uh, these people as a church were a first-class church, they were running a first-class program, he said, you have forgotten your first love. And so while I can't in good consciousness talk about other churches, we at New Horizon must realize and recognize anytime that we put a program in front of him, we're obviously going to get a message from heaven, and that is don't forget who you are. Don't forget who I am, and don't forget who your first love is, and you never put an activity in front of a relationship. You never do that, for he says, you have left your first love, and in leaving that, you have left me. And, and so now he says, you left, but guess what? I'm right where I always have been. I have never left. And, and he says, you no longer have a fire for me inside of your heart, a place for me as far as the permanence goes for your life. And so that's what we have here is we have a heart problem. There's a heart problem with this church. And so he says, therefore, remember, look at this in verse 5, therefore, remember where you have fallen. Remember when you used to be excited for me. Remember that day and repent and do the deeds you did at first when you didn't have all that Bible knowledge, when you didn't have this opportunity to go to church all the time, when the only thing you had going was just me. Remember that, he says, all you had was me back in the day. I want to go back to that, Jesus says, and I need you to go back to that where I was your sustenance, where I was your every word, where you woke, woke up in the morning not knowing what I was going to do that day, but it sure was going to be good. You couldn't wait to see that. And some of you remember when you were married and you were never happier than you were in that particular moment, and you were happy in an apartment. You were happy when you didn't have very much furniture. You were happy when you had to scrape pennies together to get food and, and now you have all that stuff. You've got stuff now, but you don't have relationship. So he's trying to remind you, go back to the day when you and I were in relationship with one another. And he says, repent and then go back to your first priority. Now watch this now. Or he says, or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Now, just so you know, there's only one thing that you can repent of in the Bible, and that is sin. So obviously, if you lose your first love, if Jesus Christ is not your first priority, then guess what you've done? 
That's called a sin. That's the only thing you can repent of in the Bible. So if you've put camping first, if you've put uh, uh, um, relationships with other people first, if you've put your work first, you are walking in a sin that, that Jesus is telling you, you got to come back from this. And it's no small thing. This isn't a secondary item he's talking to you about. It's the primary thing of importance here. And it's important enough that you could lose your lampstand over it. I didn't say, don't look at me like I'm the only one talking here, right? This is Jesus telling us this. Or, or, or to put it another, another way, I'll have to put the light of your lampstand out. And so he says, yeah, you're, you're having church, but, but I'm not there. You're having a, a meeting with other Christians, but guess what? I wasn't invited. And, and so he says, you're, his light won't be there. His preeminence won't be in the forefront. His presence won't be there, even if he is the one that is right next to you. Now, how about that? So you see, when I walk in the house, it's not about me. When you walk into this building, it's not about you. He says, it always has to be about me. Now, why would he want to stay there if it's only about you? Why would he want to be in this building if it's only about you doing church today by yourself? So let me be honest enough to, uh, to, to say this to you, that far too much goes on in churches today in the name of Christianity that God doesn't have a cotton-picking thing to do with. And that's a sad thing to know about. You're against this, or you're against that, or our doctrine has to be this way, or has to be that way, or we don't accept you if you dress a certain way, or look a certain way, or if you have a goatee, or if you don't have a goatee. Are you like us? Do you match up like us? And saints, I'm going to tell you, especially in this day that we live in, that has no place in the body of Christ, saying that they can't, if they're not like you, well, that's not good enough. That has no place in Christianity. And it certainly has no place in this church. So in verse 4, he says, or 6, he says this, but yet you do have this, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And he says, you're against this, you're against that. Now, I like that, but I'm not liking it enough to where it's at the expense of leaving something like me out of it. And even though he's writing to the church, at the end of this letter, he starts getting personal. Now watch where he does it. He says in verse 7, he says, if you got an ear to hear, you better hear what I got to say. Now he's going to the individuals here, right? And he says, if you've got an ear, listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches and especially you right now as the individual. See, maybe talking to the churches, but he's really looking looking for the person who will pay attention. He wants to know that you're going to listen to what he has to say. So he finishes his message to the Ephesian church by saying this. He says, to him who overcomes, remember he's talking to the individual now. He was talking to the church as a whole, but he's individualizing it for you right now. And he says, to him, to the individual that overcomes. And to qualify, you have had to have something that you overcame. But guess what? If you can overcome in one area, you can overcome in all areas. And he's trying to convince you right now to him who overcomes. So whatever the challenge in that letter is, or the letter to you in your life is, if you can overcome that. Now, now, now what does it look like to be an overcomer? Because if you're going to be an overcomer, you're overcoming the te temptation to be in second place. And you're moving that item back into first place. So he's been talking about the same thing all along, putting something else ahead of him. So if you can overcome that, if you can put those things back in, line, in alignment with him, to him he says, I will grant, watch this, here's the prize now. He says, if you can be an overcomer, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, you understand he's writing to believers here. He's writing to Christians here. And some of these folks from the Ephesian church may not have been overcomers. But in fact, they may have succumbed to life's temptations. In fact, wouldn't you say that's probably obvious? Because we all have at one time or another. We've all left God in a position of being in second place. So he's talking to you, and he's talking to me. But to the one that doesn't yield to that, to the one that, that, that says, I will be an overcomer, this is what he says. Watch this. He says, I'm going to let him eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, I've got to talk to you about 
that tree. Because I think you remember Eden, and I think you remember that, that there was a lot of trees in the excuse me, in that garden. But he said, there's only one that you can't touch, and that's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Stay away from that one. It's a bad tree. It starts out tasting good. It even looks better. But once you let the taste settle in, it's got a foul aftertaste, and you don't want to eat of that tree. But there was another tree, and, and there was power in the first tree, oh, but wait till you see the power that is in the second tree. That one's called the tree of life. And when you're looking at that tree, imagine what it would have been like for Adam and Eve if only they would have eaten of that tree first. If they would, if they would have eaten of that one, it would give them a special how can we say it, a special level of intimacy that wasn't available with that other tree because while the other tree drove them away from God, this particular tree right here, the tree of life would drive them to a relationship with God and a position to be able to, to have something that they could never experience otherwise. And by the way, this is what he's, uh, as a side note, um, he could eat any tree that he wanted to he was supposed to take, take away or stay away from one tree, but there's this one special tree, the tree of life. And Adam had fallen into the trap of looking at the wrong tree. And I think you and I can do that on an everyday basis because if you fall into the, the trap of eating uh, the, the, the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what would have happened had he gotten that other tree after that? That's why the angel came into the garden and split him away from that because he would have been trapped in that, never been able to, to um, be in relationship or, or in a relationship with God, but he'd have been in relationship with God in sin almost exactly the way that the devil had been himself. So he couldn't let the devil, or the, he could, God could not let Adam participate in that tree after he'd eaten the other tree. But uh, I, I just want you to see that these two trees conflict with each other. One gives life and one gives death. One brings you closer to God and the other drives you away from God. But this, it separates that relationship with death if you eat of the one tree. And Adam had to immediately be thrown from the garden since he had e eaten from the wrong tree. Now, Adam and Eve would have immediately placed God's love and his judgment in eternal conflict had he eaten of, of both of those trees at the same time. However, that would have happened, or what would have, hap uh, what would have happened if Adam would have experienced the kind of life that Revelation is talking about here? If that would have happened, that special relationship with God, even above every other relationship with God that, that was out there, he says, to him who overcomes, I will grant them the right to eat of the tree, which is the paradise of God. Saints, you've got to see, God loves the overcomer. He loves everybody. But this, this one who is an overcomer, he's granting a special present, and that's for you to be able to eat of the tree of life. And, and so this is is what he says that special relationship even above all others in heaven he says to him who overcomes I will grant them the right to be able to eat of the tree of life which is the paradise of God and so there's something special about that tree uh, and it's a gift not given to everybody who just simply received Jesus Christ as their Savior. It only comes to the overcomer. And how many of you know that there's a lot of difference between someone who just barely gets to heaven, who's never been an overcomer, but they said, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ, but they struggle all their life, and someone who is an overcomer throughout their life. They overcome the temptations. They walk away from the things that are in front of them to make more money or to have deeper uh, uh, pockets of, of getting involved in relationships and in, in, in businesses and other things outside of God. How many of you understand that a lot of, a, a lot of believers live defeated lives? They live that life because they're not an overcomer. They still go to heaven, but they were not classified as overcomers. And so how many of you know that there's people 
people that live in constant fear all their life about what's going to happen tomorrow, about what's going to, to uh, uh, what event is going to take place. Oh, we have COVID today, but it might pop up uh, in the fall. And if it does that, oh me, oh my, I don't think I can take another day of this. And, and you live your life in fear, constantly wondering how you will make it to tomorrow. And they may have even considered suicide instead of trusting in Christ. Do you see the parallel here? He's saying you can be an overcomer. Be an over, you can overcome this. And it's funny, funny because later on, I think it's in chapter 12, it says that they overcame these things, the people that he's talking about, they overcame it and they overcame it by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. See, my testimony will always be that I walk in faith believing, right? I walk in things I, I, I don't see the results of yet, but I trust that the Lord has my every single step. So by the word of my testimony, but thank God I can do that because of the blood of the Lamb. So that's not very different from us today. There's people always choosing to eat from the tree of life over or the tree of knowledge over the tree of life. I want to choose this because it looks good. I want to choose that because it feels good. And they're doing that all the time. But that tree always has had death attached to it. It's always been there. And, and I hope this makes sense to you. Because as we go along, I need you to see that, that you're not going to find everybody in heaven is equal. There are some people that barely make it there. And there's people who have been overcomers in their life. And see, it's the same as saying this. Not everybody lives in Denver. But all of us in this state live in Colorado. Uh, they, they may abide just outside the boundary, or, or they don't live in the heart of this city, but they live just outside of the city. But how many of you wonder, know that there's a world of a difference between those that live in Cherry Hills, for example, and maybe those that live in your neighborhood or my neighborhood? Every place is different. It may be in the same city, but it doesn't mean that it is the same, because equal isn't always equal in heaven. You got to heaven, but there are greater rewards for some than there are for others. And heaven is a place, but not every place in heaven is equal. I just need you to, to think that through, and you need to see what the Word of the Lord is saying right here. Getting to heaven is the ultimate, right? But God is saying, you think that's amazing? I could amaze you even more. Trust in me. I love what the Old Testament scripture says. Trust in the Lord and do good, and so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he'll give you the desire of your heart. But can you see, saints, that if you dwell in fear all the time, if you're thinking about, oh, me, oh, my, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, then all you do is take that trust, and, and, and it's, um, it's watered-down trust then, isn't it? In other words, it's not complete trust. And I think the greatest word that anybody can hear, either you or me, is what we hear when Jesus welcomes us into the great uh, uh, gates of heaven. And he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, but boy, I got something for you. I'm going to make you a ruler over many things. Welcome into the joy of the Lord. And that's good. That's special. That's something you don't want to miss. But imagine being offered a special place even above that because you get to eat of the tree of life. And I know you like apples, but, but how about that apple, right? And, and so a deeper experience in him, a deeper relationship with him, not in eternity to come, but right now, and that gains you entrance to eat of that fruit. It's just something that, that can't be duplicated here on earth once you get to heaven, right? So he says, be an overcomer here, and I will reward you for that in heaven. All right, now that's at Ephesus. But watch now, he's going to go to the second church, and he goes to uh, Smyrna, which is in verse 8. And this church, so to speak, uh, he's speaking to the pastor of the church at Smyrna, uh, which has experienced a lot of persecution and really a lot of martyrdom. And if you go into uh, every week, by the way, we're going to be having uh, additional study papers on this of notes that I've gotten. If you want to go deeper into that, uh, we're going to have that available on our website. And I'll be able to tell you a little bit more about this church at Smyrna. Uh, but uh, the Smyrna is a faithful church. Let me read to you what this says here in verse 8. 
to the angel in the church at Smyrna, write this, the first and the last, who was dead and has come to life. And he says this, this is what he says in verse 9, I know your tribulation and I know your poverty, but you are rich. You might be poor in their eyes, but I see you as rich. And and the blasphemy by those who say that they are Jews, but they're not. They, they are a synagogue of Satan. Oh, man, that'd be about the worst compliment you could get from, from the Lord. A synagogue of Satan. Those who thought that they were doing well, but they were doing evil. And, and in verse 10, it says, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. For behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you'll be tested. And you'll have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. Notice here he's offering the present again. If you're an overcomer, if you do this, I'll give you the crown of life. And then he says, like he said to the last church, if you've got an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And look at this. Watch this. It talks about overcomers again. He says, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Wow. See, Smyrna is that faithful church. Smyrna is that, that church that may be under persecution. Satan is all over them, but they are a faithful church. And what a thing to be said about you. See, interestingly enough, their persecution comes mostly from those who say that they call upon the name of the Lord, but he states here that they are of the synagogue of Satan. And one of the most Difficult things for us as Christians to do is to see beyond the veil of our life here. But uh, he's telling them, I know the persecution you're under. And I know what it's cost many of you. It's cost some of you your lives, but your jobs, maybe your wealth, even, even some of your families. It may have been that has split families apart because your husband didn't believe, but you did. Your wife believed, but you didn't. And, and it may have cost some really great government contracts, maybe a couple of big money grants, but... But you put me first, he said. <clears throat> and when you put me first, I'm going to make sure that I make up for that. Let me get some water. He said, you may have given up these things, but I will make up for it for you. Now, he says, you think you're poor, but I've got some news for you. The richness that I'm going to give to you, that I'm going to add to you, is never going to be matched on anything on this earth. So, baby, you may look like you're poor, but <laughs> you are rich. So keep on doing what you're doing. See, for, for God to call anybody rich, I think that's something I can't understand because he's got a cattle on a thousand hills. So if, and God can make anything happen. He is that, I guess on earth, we call it that genie in the bottle, so to speak, but, or genie out of the bottle. But on top of all of this that he's going to give to you, he says, I will give you the crown of life. And, and I'm telling you, by the way, in, in most of America's history, we can probably and, and rightly say that nobody has ever been persecuted for their belief. But folks, I'm going to tell you something that's changing. That is changing right before us, where we're seeing churches that are persecuted. Even this last week, the governor uh, was, uh, I think it was last Sunday, the governor was, uh, had pushed an issue through about abortion, I believe it was. I believe that's what it was about. And uh, about, um, anyway, the issue was, he said, well, we'll let people come to the courthouse here, or down to uh, uh, the Capitol building, and they can tell us their feelings about it. And you know what he did? It didn't get advertised. And it got put out so that the only time that they could come was on a Sunday morning during church, when church people are here. So let me tell you something. That's a form of persecution. That's a form of, of saying, no, I don't care what God says. I don't care what the people of God say. We're going to have our way. And, and, and we are persecuted for that. See, one of the most difficult things for us to understand is that we can be persecuted and anybody cares. But I guess I can tell you this. It it is noticed in heaven, and God knows it, notices it. And the persecution of the church is, is getting to the point to where it's not even going to be hidden anymore. And it's something I don't understand, but I know that it's growing, and I know that it's growing, and I know that it's growing. And by New Horizons taking our constitutional right to assemble for our faith, 
even right here, like we're doing right now, it may come to the point to where we're imperiled. And I tell you what, it may come to me where I'm imperiled, where I go to jail for the fact that we hold church when nobody else should hold church, when the government says you can't do church, not in your home, not in a building like this, you can't do it. And believe me, I hold on to this promise when I see that. And I hold on to it with great pride, and I will always hold on to it with great pride. Now, in the days and the months and the the years and maybe, God willing, and not coming, the decades to come, if Jesus doesn't call an end to this, uh, then some of you are going to be held accountable for your faith, for the things that you so, so hold dear today. I don't want that. You don't want that. But the day is coming. And and so it could affect your business. It could affect your ability to provide for your family. And it could get to the point to where you go to jail for your beliefs. And saints, let me tell you this. If you don't decide right now what you believe in and what you're willing to do for your faith, then when it comes down to it, you will be bent. And you will be torn between two loves. Because you want to love to do the things that you do with freedom. And you remember the freedom that we've had in the United States here. But that's being challenged today. Every one of our amendments are being challenged. The right to be able to get together like we're doing right now is one of those most sacred ones. But settle it now, church, where you stand. Settle it now who you believe in. I love what Paul said when he said, I've known whom I've believed, and I'm persuaded that he'll keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Settle in your hearts now what you will do and what you're willing to uh, be held accountable for, and that is exactly what God is telling the church at Smyrna. He said, I know that you've been under persecution, but you have held tight, and you have held your, your position See, we're living in a day today, though, where this passage right here has become a reality. And I need you to notice, in this church, unlike any of the other churches, there is no judgment, there is no condemnation that's given to this particular people, this particular church. There is nothing negative said to them. And the reason why is their commitment to their excellence, to their commitment to their belief. With their commitment, they took a stand and they didn't waver from it. And, as, and I want you to notice that the reward that he says here, despite the persecution, despite the, 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 the compromise being seen all around them, they refused to let go of what they believed. And they refused to compromise for what they believed. And because of their unwavering belief in Jesus, Christ and they took a stand for him verse 11 says this watch this he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death no 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 wait 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 a second second death I uh, oh boy the second death in the Bible is total separation from God that's right and I can tell you this you stake, take a stand for Jesus Christ, and before God Almighty and all the angels, Jesus Christ will take a stand for you, and that second death will never touch you. And what he's trying to say is this, is when the time of separation between the sheep and the goat comes, God has to identify with a certain group of people, and the ones that he'll identify are the ones that have taken a stand for him and have been overcomers. And that death, that final death, that second death will not affect you. And I'm saying, praise God for that. I want to take a stand for him today, don't you? And he's saying, don't be, you will not be touched by any negative consequence in judgment because of your faith in time of trouble. All right, now that's the church of Smyrna. And in many ways, you could say this was a perfect church. Many ways, you could say this is a church that really had their priorities straightened out. But for every one of those that you have, you have another one that that just isn't that way. So let's look at the church at Pergamum. By the way, you could call the church at Pergamum, it was a compromising church. While Smyrna never compromised, Pergamum had trouble with that. Let's pick up at verse 12, and this is what it says. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. He says, I know where you dwell. I know where Satan's throne is and that you hold fast my name and you didn't deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, your witness, my witness, excuse me, my faithful one who is killed among you where Satan dwells. 
Oh, that must have been a terrible place to have church at. But he says in verse 14, but I have a few things against you because you have there someone who holds the teachings of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak, like, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of God, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. And verse 15 says, So you also have some who in the same way hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So you have the teachings of Balaam, who would, who would uh, for money, prophesy against the people of God or do something that's counter to the things of God. But you also have the, the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So therefore repent. Or else I'm going to come to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, here it is again. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him who overcomes, I will give him some of that hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except those who receive it. See, now, now let me tell you something about Pergamum before I get into the heart of this. Pergamum was, was really the capital city for this Asian province in the first century. Remember, Asia is smaller at this time. It's just a, like we would call a county in a state or a state in a country. And so Asia today is, is a continent, but not in this particular day. It's just a province. And Pergamum is the capital city of Asia in the first century. And it's a city that's given over to many Greek idols, not a few, but many. And so therefore, it was overrun by a spiritual, satanic condition. And the atmosphere was charged, I guess you could say, with the presence of Satan. But in the middle of that, this church held their ground. In the middle of that, they didn't forget who they were. Yet, by, uh, yet in the middle of all of that, they were pushed by the government to compromise their belief. And when it came to compromising, that was a whole different thing. They remembered that they were a church. They remembered that they belonged to God. But they started compromising their beliefs. And they folded like a deck of cards. And, and so they compromised. And we call this a compromising church uh, because what uh, they did, what Balaam did. And what happened there? Uh, Balaam tried to... Uh, uh, do something for God, said he wanted to be a prophet for God. But when Balak came in, he paid Balaam to be able to prophesy against the people of God. So what he was doing is he was doing the things of God for money. Know anybody like that in churches today? Have you seen anybody on TV that you think might be that way, that does it only for money? And see, whenever you do something for God, whenever you call upon the name of the Lord, but you get in the position of compromising the things of God for gain, then you place yourself in a position of being at war with God. And saints, you do not ever want to find yourself in that position. And so let the, the benefits go by. We don't want the benefits if it means that you're going to compromise your faith and your work in God. So when God says to New Horizons, when he says to our church, oh, guys, you're doing a lot of things right, but here's the deal. You're putting a stumbling block in front of people who want to do right. Then, baby, we better pay attention to what that's saying. You cannot call upon the name of the Lord and hurt people people at the same time. You can't do that. You can't promote things for, for God and for His will and then cause other people to stumble. You can't do that, saints. See, it's a big deal for God because He doesn't want us to cause somebody else to stumble. Now, now, Paul said it another way. He said, I become all things to all men that I might win a few. And I got that so that I want to relate to you in a way so that you won't stumble, so that you'll come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. But what does it do for a person if he sees you walking in sin, the very sin that he has stumbled over, then he stumbles over it again. So he's saying you can't, you can't be like that. But then again, Let's don't focus on that. What happens to the person who overcomes? Because this actually has, this church has a whole benefit package that I really like. And again, I, I've told you this before, but, but we can relate our spiritual life to every one of these seven churches. But watch this benefit package. You're going to like this. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on that stone, which nobody knows except him who receives it. Now, I've got to tell you, there's some deep 
deep stuff right in here, and I hope that I can do it justice, but let me take it one at a time. Many of you will remember that, the, of course, the first thing mentioned here is manna, but many of you will remember that what manna is, is that bread-like substance, like bread, but they really didn't know what it was that was given to the people of Israel in the desert in that 40-year sojourn that they had. And in fact, the word Manna means, what is it? <laughs> they had no idea what it was. But that's a good question. As it came down, they said, well, what in the world is this? But you need to know that it was God's secret supply for Israel. You've got to know that there was, there was, there was, there was a, a provision inside that manna that would need, uh, meet every one of their health needs. It always took care of their health needs. And so the Bible says that they went through 40 years and there was no sickness among them. There was not even a, a speck of the flu or a, a, a speck of, a, of a, a cold. They had none of that because God took care of them and he nourished them with this manna. And so this isn't some, just, just some kind of an Old Testament deal because Philippians 4.19 says this, that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. So it's me today saying, I know that God will provide my needs. But I want you to see that, that in heaven... It's over abundantly. It's over a, a care for your every need in heaven. And you're going to get that. See, where when you put your trust in God, that's when obstacles start. When you start to say, well, I'm going to believe God for this in my life. that will no longer be a problem for me. Or I'm believing God for a special job. That's when your job uh, situation starts to be an obstacle. And you start tripping over things because the devil wants to get your eyes off of God's provision. But he's saying for those that overcome, I will give you the manna of God. I will give you something you've never seen. I know it's hidden to you now, but I'll give it to you. I will give it to you. And by the way, he doesn't say that that's in the ever after. He says, if you're going to be an overcomer now, I'm going to give you that hidden manna. I will provide your every need according to my riches and glory. And so he says, to the one that overcomes not causing anyone to stumble or, or be compromised like you were, like many of the people in that church were, you and I are going to have a private dinner party. <laughs> it's going to be something. In other words, this manna isn't going to be just for the saved Christian. It's going to be for the overcoming Christian. But here's the part I want you to see, the second part of this, this wonderful benefit package. He says, I'm going to give you a white stone. Now, that doesn't, may not mean much to you, but, but really the synonym for this of a white stone has deep uh, meaning. If you went back into the time of the Roman government, um, when a man would win or a woman would win a, a let's, let's say he won the decathlon or he won a wrestling match or it was Olympian uh, e event, it, one of the ways that you would be ticketed to be able to go to a special event afterward for the award thing was to be able to get that white stone. And it would be, uh, it was the Roman uh, a way of being able to be awarding a sp uh, you the ticket to be able to go to a special awards banquet. And I can't help but wonder what kind of overcomers victory banquet that you and I are going to have when we have our white stone. When I show that to the Lord and I say, see, this lets me right in. And, and I need you to understand, this is an overcomer. This isn't somebody who's just been rummaging through life, barely get, living on Barely Get Along Street, right next to Grumble Alley. This is somebody who's an overcomer, and it's good to have a white stone. But to have a white stone with your name on it, well, that's a whole different story. That's season tickets, baby. That, that, that's not just a ticket to one event. You get to go to all of them because your name is written on that. And I love what the word says when it says, there's a, or that old song that says, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. I love that song. I was so excited last year when I was traveling down to uh, uh, Port Charlotte for the New Horizons Church that we helped to start down there. And I started, uh, if you know the, how this works in, in, uh, when you're getting on a plane, most of the airlines do the same thing. They have line one, two, three, four, five, and sometimes six, depending on the size of the airline. And I was always in five or six. 
But the more I traveled down there, the further down I got. And do you know I got all the way down to line two? And, and uh, that meant that when I got on the, the plane, I got to load my luggage before anybody else did. Have you ever been on a plane? You get to the plane and there's just no room left for your a briefcase, your suitcase, or your luggage that you want to put up there? And it's, it's frustrating. So I got comfortable before anybody else was able to get comfortable on that plane because of my position. You might say I had a white stone with my name on it. And I love that. I like that. But uh, can you imagine? There was this one time when I was traveling with my wife and, and, and Jackie. Uh, because of all the travel that she's had with Motorola, she has a lot more miles than I did. And she would often as not get upgraded to first class. And you know what she'd say to me when she got upgraded? She'd say, bye-bye, honey. <laughs> I'll be up here if you need something. Oh, by the way, they won't let you come up and talk to me, so stay back in your seat back there in the number two or the number three position. Oh, well. You know, see, the reason that you wanted this, though, is I've been on flights where it seemed like I was seated between two Bulgarian weightlifters that hadn't taken a shower before they got on the plane from LaGuardia, New York to, uh, to, to Anaheim, California, and, and I can sure... Uh, assure you of this, that I would much rather be in first class than in last class. So l let me put it this way, and this is what Jesus wants you to know. How much do you appreciate your salvation? How much do you appreciate your redemption? How much do you value the price that was paid for you? Because Jesus Christ, Christ paid a price for you, or do you not value it at all? See, when you compromise your beliefs, no, let me back up. You compromise one belief, and then you will easily compromise the next, and the next, and the next. And like dominoes, they seem to fall down. But what Jesus is saying for you as we close right now is this. To the one who rises above, just being saved. To the one who rises above, uh, 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 having, uh, who places a high value on just or, or on more than just being saved to the one who rises above just being a a nominal christian to the one who realizes that relation a deeper relationship with jesus christ is more precious precious than just kind of paying attention to him when you get the opportunity to those i will give a specially uh, a special benefit because benefits have privileges, do they not? See, saints, what I want you to know today, and, and this is all that we have time for today, is just these three churches, and we'll get to the rest of them, all four of them next week. But what I need you to see is this, that the benefit that you have by being an overcomer far, is far greater than anything that any money, any job, any position, any temptation on this earth could ever replace. Don't eat of the one apple. You want to eat of the tree of life. Would you bow your heads today? Our dearest Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for what you have done for our church. I thank you, Lord, for what you have, have done in, in leading us into a place to where we can become overcomers. And this is what I ask of you today, Lord, that our people would not look at the things that tempt them to be able to turn their eye from you. I ask, Lord, that we would be the church that is an overcomer. In all these churches, they always, the, 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 the angel always made them look at the overcoming part of their relationship. Lord, I want to be an overcomer because of what I believe in you. I want to be able to see into the supernatural world and understand that even though I may not be able to see it, I can feel the presence of it, Lord. And so help me, Father, to be able to turn my eyes upon Jesus and look full in your wonderful face so that the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the eyes of your wonderful face. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I love you so much. I can't wait to see you next week. And, and more and more people are starting to come back to church again. I encourage you to be safe. I encourage you to, to be careful uh, of the things that are out there. But I mostly encourage you, do not fear. Be an overcomer. God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.